Oh, I forgot something. Like, my room is so messy. I think that's my room. Like, I worked from 12 to 6. All right. And I worked until, like, 7.20. And I was like, I've got to get out of here. My mom just didn't wonder where the heck I am and my battery was low. So I was like, I've got to get out. Okay, hopefully that will be good. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at any questions that we may have. Homework and then. I was just gonna say it's so nice to see everybody's mouth. They want to see everybody's smile. Okay, so questions. What section was it, Easton? Uh, 10 .5. 5. Okay, so we need to look at any homework questions you may have from 10 5, 10 6, or 10 7. We didn't have much. So 10 5, pages 632 and 633. On that section, we had 11 through 27 odds. Oh, yes. So questions? Number 25, definitely. 27. 23. 23, 25, 27. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, so when we look at these, so real quick, let's look at our theorems that we looked at in this section. The first one was over on page 629. We had the theorem about when I have two chords that intersect. And so we learned that if I have two intersecting chords, I multiply each segment together and they are equal to each other, okay? Um, over on 630, I had theorem 1016, if I have two secant segments, so I've got exterior and I've got interior um, with secant segments, but then 1017 was when I have a tangent and a secant segment. So in 1016, Again, I multiply my exterior segment by the entire segment, set it equal to the other exterior segment multiplied by the entire segment. And then if it's a tangent and a secant, I have my tangent squared is equal to the exterior secant segment multiplied by the entire secant, okay? So let's look at number 23. When I look at number 23, I can see that I have my exterior um, tangent, and I can see that I've got an exterior secant and a total secant. So in 23, I know that I'm dealing with, um, basically I have my exterior tangent squared is equal to exterior secant times total secant. Okay, so what is my exterior tangent in 23? 11, number 23 on page 633. 11 squared. 11 squared is equal to, what is my exterior secant segment? X. X, X. times X plus, plus nine. nine. Okay, so 11 squared is 121 is equal to, I'm gonna distribute, I've got X squared plus nine X. We talked about where um, if I get to the point where I see X squared right here, then I know that I'm going to need to um, express this as a quadratic equation. I need to put it in standard form where I have AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. Move the one, so I'm going to move that 121 by subtracting it. So I have zero is equal to X squared plus 9X minus 121. Now we talked about how you can factor. We could set up our two sets of parentheses and break it into a binomial if I want to try to find factors of 121 that multiply together to make nine or factors of negative 121 that multiply together to make nine. Um, if not, I can always use my quadratic formula. And we said the quadratic formula is negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four AC all over two A. So that's what I'm gonna do in this problem. So if I have my quadratic equation to be able to put it into quadratic formula, what information do I have to identify? What do I have for this equation a, to be able to put it? A, B, and C. So A is equal to? Zero. Mm -mm. What number is in front of X? 
One. B is equal to? Nine. Nine. And C is equal to? Negative 121. So I'm going to put it into x equals negative 9 plus or minus the square root of 9 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 121 all over 2 times 1. Okay, so x is equal to negative 9 plus or minus the square root of what is 9 squared? 81. Now I've got negative four times one. What is Positive negative four, four times one? Negative four. Negative four. What is negative four times negative 121? <clears throat> Positive or negative? Positive. Why? Because there's Good. 81 minus. I'm sorry, plus 484 all over 2. Now I've got 484 plus 81. X is equal to negative 9 plus or minus the square root of 565 all over 2. Now, what did we talk about when I have, um, when I am expressing my solution, what form do we know in this example? Notice this is plus or minus. Is this how I'm gonna leave my answer? Yes. Why? Why, Claire? You have to have a positive and a negative answer. Okay, well, I have a positive and negative answer, but what's gonna happen if I start with a negative nine and I take something away? What kind of answer am I gonna have? I'm gonna have a negative answer. And what did we say when I'm talking about link? It has to be a positive solution. So I know that in this answer, I need negative nine plus the square root of 565 over two. So what is the square root of 565? Let's go ahead and express it as a decimal. So square root of 565. 23.7697. Okay, so let's go ahead and round that to 23.8. So I've got negative nine plus 23.8 over two. Order of operations tells me I need to take care of that numerator before I can divide by two. So I've got negative nine plus 23.8 is 14.8 divided by two. It's gonna be approximately 7.4, okay? So you could either leave it in radical form or you can express it as a decimal. I'll take it either way, okay? But just know that sometimes you may see, especially if it was like SAT, ACT, they may express it as a decimal and you've got to pick out the decimal answer. So you've got to know how to express this as a decimal. Okay, so that is 23. Next one, 25. So for number 25, we have got our circle. Let me try to draw it the best I can. So we've got that and then that and then that. So this is 30, this is Y, this little section there is eight. This one's 20 and this is X. Okay, so in this situation, I've got two different variables. Obviously, I can only solve for one at a time. So when I'm looking at this one, I want to cover this up right now. So I'm going to cover up my other segments. And I'm only going to focus on this tangent segment and this secant segment. Okay, and we just talked about how I have tangent squared is equal to exterior secant times total secant. So to be able to solve for x, I've got 20 
squared is equal to eight times x plus eight. 20 squared is 400. I'm gonna distribute eight x plus 64. Take away 64 from each side. That leaves me what? Um, 336 is eight x, divide by eight, divide by eight. And x is equal to 42. Okay, so the first thing I had to do was focus only on the term. Now, I'm gonna focus only on y. So that means I have, this is my tangent segment now. So I'm gonna have eight squared is equal to y times y plus 30. Eight squared is 64. Distribute y squared plus 30y. What do I need to do? I have a variable squared. So you need to move the 64 to the other side. I need to move the 64 to the other side. Well, remember, I've got to go standard form. Oh, 30y. Oh. Mm -hmm. So y squared plus 30y minus 64. Okay. So again, in this one, I could either okay. think about terms that multiply together to make 64, or I can use my quadratic formula. So I'll go ahead and set up my quadratic formula. What is A? A uh, one. B? 30. C? Okay. So in this situation, we're solving for y. So y equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So y is equal to negative 30 plus or minus the square root of, what's 30 squared going to be? A big boy number. Well, what's 3 times 3? It is 900. 900. Now, minus four times one times negative 64 all over two times one is two. Y is equal to negative 30 plus or minus the square root of 900 minus what's negative four times one? Negative, negative four, what's negative four times negative 64? 256. Positive 256. Oh, yeah, it is. All over two. So now y is equal to negative 30 plus or minus the square root of 900 plus 256 is going to be 1156 all over two. What is the square root of 1156? 34. 34? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to come over here. Y is equal to negative 30 plus or minus 34 over 2. So that means in this situation, I have Y is equal to negative 30 plus 34 over 2, and Y is equal to negative 30 minus 34 over 2. What is negative plus 34? 4. So Y um, what is negative 30 plus 34? We said 4 mm -hmm. over 2 equals 2. Something's wrong with this. 4. 64 over 2. It's going to be negative 32, so we know it can't be that. What did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. 8 squared is 64, y, y 30. Let me check my calculations. I put in negative 30 plus or minus, 30 squared was 900. So four times 64 was 256 plus 900. 
The square root of 1156 was 34. Negative 30 plus or minus 34. I have Z is negative 400. You had what? C was negative 400. Or G. Yeah. C. Oh, where, um, I did it different, but I did, um, when I set up, when I, once I figured out what X was, I did, um, 8 times 8 plus 42 equals Y times Y plus 40. You know what I did? Okay, so. Okay, so what did I do wrong in that situation? What did I do wrong? Look at what I use here. Look at your picture. What should I have used? Look at the picture in the book. Why is eight not the number to use? What is eight part of? Eight is part of a secant. I should have used 20. Eight was part of my secant. I just covered that up and looked at eight and said, hey, 20 was what I should have used because eight is part of the secant. Okay. So this should be 20. So this should be 400. That should be 400. 400. 400. So when I come under here, this should be minus 400. So that should be plus 1600. 900 and 1600 is 2500. Square root of 2500. Is it a positive or negative 400? So over here it was positive. Okay. When I moved it, I had to subtract it so okay. it became negative. Okay. Yeah. So then, so this was negative 200. So when I multiplied it by the negative 4, now it became positive. So negative 4 how times negative 400. Yeah, how is it 200? What, how is what 200? C. C I'm sorry, it should be 4. I just, oh, I was, yeah, sorry. Okay, so now we said 1600 and 900 is going to be 2500. What's the square root of 2500? Um, 15. 15. 50. 50, oh. sorry. So I've got negative 30 plus or minus 50 divided by 2. So negative 30 plus 50 is going to be 20 divided by 2 is 10. Negative 30 minus 50 is negative 80, which is a negative 40. And we said we cannot use a negative answer. So why is 10? Okay. So my mistake there was I have to find the tangent. Now, I could have subbed in 42 for X, and I could have said secant segment times entire segment is equal to secant segment times entire segment. I could have done that, and I would have found the same answer. But if we want to, but one of the things that we don't want to do is use the numbers that we have solved for just in case we've made a mistake. Okay. I'm a little bit confused of what you did on that side, like how you got. So basically we said that I ended up with negative 30 plus or minus the square root of 2,500. Okay. So that's what this is right here. We okay. said the square root of 2,500 was 50. Okay. Okay. So I've got negative 30 plus or minus 50 divided by two. So that means I've got two problems here. I've got negative 30 plus 50 divided by two, and I have negative 30 minus 50 divided by two. So when I solve each of those, Negative 30 plus 50 is 20 over 2 is going to simplify to 10. Okay. And then negative 30 minus 50 is negative 80. Negative 80 divided by 2 is a negative 40. And we said we cannot use a negative solution. So we know our answer is going to be 10. Okay. okay. So that's the main thing about remembering when you have plus or minus, that means I've actually got two problems there that I've got to solve for just to check it. Okay. And 27. Oh boy. And now we'll make sure that we've got the right, using the right. 
part of the problem. Okay, 27, we have got our circle. We have got a secant segment. We have a tangent segment. And then we have a chord. Okay, so notice we have 8 and 18, X and 12. Y, nope, that's a two, nope, I'm on the wrong, seven. Am I writing the numbers for the wrong problem? I am, I'm doing number 26. Okay, so we have X, this is three, six, 14, Y, and eight. All right, so what do we have going on in this problem? In the last one, we had a secant, we had secant segments, we also had tangent segments. Okay, so what do we have in this one? What is this part right here? What are these? Oh, I can't remember what the name of it. Intersecting thing. chords. You go x times six is equal to three times 14. Okay, so that's how I'm gonna solve for x, is I've got intersecting chords. So I'm gonna have six x is equal to, 14 times three, that's gonna be what, 52? No, 42? 14 times three, 42. Divide by six, divide by six, X is equal to seven. Okay, so intersecting chords, I know I can multiply them together and set them equal to each other. Now to solve for Y. Okay, so when I'm looking at solving for Y, what did I say X was? Seven. Okay, so if this is seven, what do I know seven plus six is? 42. No, seven plus six. Because so when I'm talking about this total segment here, I know I'm gonna have tangent segment, which is eight squared is equal to y times, so external secant times total. So this will be y plus 13. Eight squared is? 64. 64 y squared plus 13y. I need to take away 64 from each side. Zero is equal to y squared plus 13y minus 64. A equals one, b is 13, c is negative 64. Y is equal to negative 13 plus or minus the square root of 13 squared minus four times one times negative 64. Got that negative 64 in finally. Y is equal to negative 13 plus or minus. What is 13 squared? 169. 169. Negative four times one is negative four. Negative four times negative 64. Positive what? 256. 256. All over two. Oh, that was two times one. Y is equal to negative 13 plus or minus the square root of, what is 169 plus 256? 425. 425 over two. So what is the square root of 425? Uh, um, Let's go four places after the decimal. 20.6155. 20 yes. All over two. So that means I have y is equal to negative 13 plus 20.6155 over two. Why am I not even gonna waste my time doing a minus? Because if I have start with a negative and I take something away, I'm gonna end up with a bigger negative, right? So um, what is negative uh, 13 plus 20.6155? 13, no, 33.6155. Got a negative plus a positive. Oh. 
7.6155 divided by 2 is equal to what? 3.3 Three point zero. Wait, wait. Three point eight zero seven seven. Three point. We'll go two places after the decimal. Okay. So yeah, three point eight one, three point eight. Okay. So in this one, we had intersecting chords. We also had a secant and a tangent. So we had to use our one formula where we multiply my chord segments together and set that equal to the other two chord segments multiplied together. And this one, we had to solve for X to be able to solve for Y. I needed that value in there, okay? Any other questions on this section, 10-5? All right, let's turn over to 10-6. 10, 10-6, six. Ten, six, we had seven through 39 odds. Any on 10 6 you need to go over? None? All right, what about 10 7? Okay, so 10 7, 6 47. And you said 37 and 41? Okay, so let's look at number 37, mixed review. Okay, what kind of triangle do I have in number 37? What kind of triangle is that? Uh, this is page 647 from 10, it's 10 7, but it's actually just mixed review. Isosceles. Isosceles, what do I know about an isosceles triangle? Yeah, all 180. My interior angles are being equal 180. So I know that is equal to 180 degrees. What do I add together to make 180? 45, 45 plus. So 42. 42. Sir. What do I know about these two angles here? Isosceles triangle, what do I know about my base angles? They're the same. So that would be like X and X, right? So 42 plus 2X is equal to 180. Subtract 42. And 2X is equal to 138. Divide by 2. Divide by 2. X is equal to... What is that, 16? Yeah. 69 degrees. Okay. And then 41. What am I doing in number 41? What do I have in 41? I have an external tangent. X squared is equal to 16 times 16 plus 20. X squared is equal to 16 times. 36. What is 16 times 36? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it makes so much sense now. X squared is equal to 576. Take the square root of each side. You just had a light bulb moment. Yep. And then he hit his head. And, it, and it, it fell down and hit him on the head. So the square root of 576 is 24. Okay, any other questions? All right, so if you need a little bit of time to get your notes fixed, um, you can turn them in. If you need to turn them in tomorrow, but if you've already got them fixed, I can take them today. So you can leave those out and we will go ahead and shift to chapter 11. Huh? Do you just stick it on the corner of your table for now and I'll get it. All right, so chapter 11, we kind of did a walkthrough of it the other day about area of um, polygons and circles. So we're gonna be starting on page 661. 
Okay, so page 661, mm -hmm. angle measures and polygons. I've given you your note section. You'll see most of these are going to be kind of filled in. So look at 11.1. says, you've already learned that the name of a polygon depends on the numbers of sides in the polygons, triangle, quadrilateral, pentagon, hexagon, and so forth. The sum of the measures of the interior angles of a polygon also depends on the number of sides. Okay, so depending on how many sides it has will depend on the sum of the interior measures. I'm completely lost. Mm -hmm. Do you have a nice nap? <laughs> we just finished going over the homework. We're starting on 11.1 on page 661. In lesson 6-1, you found the sum of the measures of the interior angles of a quadrilateral by dividing the quadrilateral into two triangles. You can use this triangle method to find the sum of the measures of the interior angles of any convex polygon within sides called an n-gon. So whenever you see something called an n-gon, n is a variable representing the unknown number of sides. Okay, so it may be that you're having to solve something to tell what kind of polygon it is. So you're having to solve for the number of sides based on the equation. Um, so we can see here, um, they've shown us a triangle, quadrilateral. I can break that into how many triangles? Page 661 in the brown box. A quadrilateral is broken into how many triangles? Two. What do I know my sum of one tri interior angles of a triangle is? 180. 180. If I have two of them, what is that interior sum going to be? 360. Look at a pentagon. How many sides does it have? How many sides does a pentagon have? Three. Three. Three sides of a pentagon? Five. Three five. A triangle is three sides. Pentagon has five sides, but how many triangles was I able to break it into? Three. Three. So I'm going to have 180 times three will be my interior measures. Look at a hexagon. How many sides does a hexagon have? Six. How many triangles is it broken into? Four. Four. Do you see a pattern going on here? It's going up by one. Huh? It's going up by one triangle. But how many sides does a quadrilateral have? Four. 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 If a quadrilateral has four sides, how many triangles does it have? Two. Two. What about a pentagon? Five sides, how many triangles? Three. Hexagon, how many sides? Six. How many triangles? Four. So notice the pattern here is however many sides I have, I subtract two and that's how many triangles I have. So uh, octagon, how many triangles would I be able to break that into? Six. What about a dodecahedron? A dodecahedron. Oh, what? Yeah. How many sides does a dodecahedron have? Ten. Two. Five, two. I know Fifteen. Twelve. Oh, <laughs> you got it, Clara. Yeah, dodecahedron. Um, so it was saying when I can't remember why it was that we were having the discussion about it. We were naming different types of shapes, and my dad's an engineer. And so I had never heard that term before. And so anyway, we we're talking about shapes and somebody goes, a dodecahedron. And we were like, you're so weird engineer. But anyway, so yeah, dodecahedron. So I learned, hey, 12 sides. <laughs> All right. So basically what I do is I take my number of sides minus two times 180 degrees. So like my triangle, I don't have triangle up here, but three minus two is one. One times 180 is 180 degrees, so a triangle. Quadrilateral, four minus two is two times 180 is 360. Pentagon, five minus two is three. Three times 180 is 540. Hexagon, six minus two is four times 180 is 720. All right, so that is our formula for finding angle measures in a polygon, but what type of polygon are we talking about here? What was the word that came before it in the last sentence above the brown box? An n-gon. Last sentence, what type of polygon? What is the word in front of polygon? Convex. Convex, what does that mean? I can't remember. Remember we talked about convex and concave? 
Yeah. Okay. Concave, like in the cave. When you extend the sides, it's going to go through the figure, whereas convex, when I extend my sides, they're all going to stay outside the figure. Take a break. Um, yes. So, I'm pretty sure that's everything. Uh, it goes from 10 7 down to 10 1. Chapter review is on top. Okay, so let's put them in reverse order. Go 10 1 through. Like, yeah, you're putting them back on top. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. last minute decision. I decided Look, we want 10 1 to be on top. I mean, so is this weeks, this is where it begins, right? Yes. So 10 1, like, I'm and we want um, 10 2 and 3 and just have a lot of stuff. 4, five, 6, 7. Chapter review. So now the top page is 10 1. Yeah, so go in order. There we go. Thank you. Welcome. Must still stay afterwards. There we yes. go. Yes. Old barn. I think on the eighth that I love the barn I work at. I've got to show you this. Do what now? There was a full barn. Oh. We named it named her Brandy. <gasps> oh, look how cute. I was oh, in the salt. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> she had no teeth though. When was that? Uh, I think she was born the 8th of April. I'm pretty sure. I need to double check that. I was there when she was born. Like, I was the first one to see her. Aww. So we don't want to put you in the studio. I was like, oh my gosh, she kept falling over. I was like, oh my gosh. She was the cute little thing. I wanted to name her Cashew, but I got outvoted. That's okay. We thought it was a boy when it was first born because we saw the umbilical cord. <laughs> and um, I was like, we're going to name it general, like in spirit. And hmm. I was like, nope, just not. <laughs> it was so funny. Mm -hmm. She's so cute, though. Uh, we let her out of her stall and her and her mom walked around the barn. That's sweet. And she ran and played. It's the cutest thing. Just had the phone yesterday. I actually got there late, so I worked an hour later. Yeah. And I don't think I'm gonna get paid this week because I have from next Friday, which oh, is the next day. Okay. Work. So I'm gonna hope that you pay me next week. Next <laughs> Friday. Yeah, I work th Tuesdays and Fridays at the barn. You said next Friday, my wedding. Yeah, next Friday is prom, so I had to ask her before, and I felt really bad about it too because she was kind of low on staff. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of the only people who's like trustworthy and that she can actually rely on. So, yeah. But I work instead of me. Okay. I don't have to talk. Sadly. Okay, so, um, Claire, did I get your test? No, I have not done my test. I will okay. send in okay. tomorrow. Okay, you're going to get it tomorrow. Yes. Okay. I've just been a little bit slow. So. <laughs> I'm okay, so this person said on my Facebook, I'm like, I need someone to do my makeup. Like, yeah. anyone available? She said, You can message me. Then I messaged her. Hey, Martin, yes. She might do it. I okay. don't know. Yeah, I messaged this person, and then she said she can do it. She's really good at makeup, that's why I'm asking. Mm -hmm. This person, she's in cosmetology. Right? And she, she was saying, like, she's terrible at responding. Like, look how she responds. It's like, well, look at that. Like, oh my god, dude. I hate people like that. And I was, like, I was admit, she was active. I hate people that respond to me nuts. And especially, in although I am really unreliable, like, especially in a group chat, they're like, Are you alive? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I wasn't, I didn't even, read especially it. like this. I'm I like, hate reading big group chats, like, in group me. And, uh, oh, I know, but so I'm much. Like, like written up a novel. Yeah. 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 So at the barn the other day, the farrier asked if, uh, if he can be my prom date, although he's a married man. And I was like, heck okay, no. I'm just sorry. <laughs> I am going with my friends, and you are a married man. You stay here and she's a horse, and I'm at prom. Yeah. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> he was all offended. He flirts with me all the time. I'm like, stop it. You're married. <laughs> and I'm like, good night. <laughs> yeah. It's a little sketch out there. <laughs> Oh well. 
I should have thrown them all the ten six because I'm doing all my homework because I did Oh my god! Like you want to wait and just turn it all in together tomorrow? Or do yeah. you want to? Yeah. Hang on to it. Oh, or do you want all of it? Just hang on to it and put it all together. I think Alec might yeah, actually be. Yeah, I think he's going to do the same thing. I just gotta start going to bed earlier. When? I don't know. But he's walking, he walked out of the bathroom like this. Okay. Where is he? We don't know. Obviously, dude. Probably out like a light. I can't imagine they didn't have a closet. He's so stressed. I've never taken a nap since I was a tiny baby. It's See, so I will take a nap in a heartbeat. I can't. Like, if I have time like, when I get home, I even if I only have 15 minutes, I will lay down and close my eyes. I took a nap in class of seventh grade. The last time I took a nap, I was sick. Like, like, I woke up and I didn't know what day it was, but plan. We had teachers in school, like, if you fell asleep, they'd come smack your desk with a ruler. I took a nap. So you knew not to go to sleep in class. I have never gone to sleep in class. Like, ever. The idea of doing that scared me. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and get back. So on 662, go ahead and turn the page to 662. Come on. Sleepy McGee. Alec, will you push that door? I mean, uh, Easton, will you push that door? <gasps> what time have you been going to bed? I think last night, two in the morning. Why? What are you doing till two in the morning? Absolutely nothing. Go to bed. If you're doing nothing. Go to bed. I'm going to start when you're asleep. I'm going to come up and go. Smack my book down on the table. I'm going to go to bed at like 9 tonight. So let's go ahead. Page 662. Okay. So it says you may have found in the activity that the sum of the measures of the interior angles of a convex n-gon is n minus 2 times 180. So that's what we found our pattern was as we were looking at these sides. So theorem 11.1 tells us that the polygon interior angles theorem says that the sum of the measures of the interior angles of a convex n-gon is n minus 2 times 180. The corollary to that is that the measure of each interior angle of a regular n-gon is 1 divided by n times n minus 2 times 180, or to simplify that, you can take n minus 2 times 180 and divide by the number of sides. So that would be if I'm trying to find the angle measures of each angle, okay? So that is your first, first bullet point on your notes. Theorem 11.1, we can find um, n minus two times 180 to find the measure of each angle. To me, the one that's gonna be easier to remember is the second one, n minus two times 180 divided by n, okay? I know what's n again is n is when we don't know the number of sides so i can plug in n could be five it could be four it could be 10 it could be 12 if it's very oh, so that's my variable because that can change depend on what shape it is okay depending on the number of sides so let's go ahead and look at example one it says finding measures of interior angles of polygons it says find the value of x in the diagram shown so how many angle measurements do i have in this problem Six. Okay, I have six angle measurements. Okay, yeah. so that means I have six sides. So what kind of shape is it? Hexagon. A hexagon. So using n minus two times one eighty. We said I would have six minus two times one eighty. Six minus two is four times one eighty equals. 720 degrees. Okay. Now I'm having to solve for X. So the first thing I had to do is I had to know what am I trying to solve to equal? Okay. So the first thing I have to do is know that the interior angles of this shape is going to equal 720. Then I need to say, what are my interior angles that I know? I know 88 plus 142 plus 105 plus x plus 136 plus 136 equals 720. So side one, two, three, four, five, six. Or I've taken or my angles. I've got six angles that I'm adding together. Notice one of those is x. So when I add those up, I've got 607 plus x is equal to 720. 
subtract 607 from each side, and X is equal to 113 degrees. On the homework, can we just add all these on the calculator and then just, uh, yeah, or I mean, yeah, y'all know that y'all can use a calculator. Yeah, you or don't you have to start work on like how to add. No, I mean, it's the kind of thing where it, the main thing that you would need to be, I would need to be able to see is that, you know, setting this part up. Okay. And so just seeing what X is equal to. Where did the 607 come from? Okay. 88 plus 40, 142 plus 105 plus 136 plus 136. Okay. All those add up to be 607. Okay. And then I have the variable X. Where so did you get 720? Because we just said a six sided oh, figure. Okay. I would have six minus two is four times 180. So I know that hexagon, the interior angles are gonna measure 720. Okay. So I had to find that first okay. to know what am I adding all these up to equal to. Okay, I was confused if, you know, that whole long thing equaled six or seven. Mm -hmm. Yes, so basically this variable X, mm -hmm. if I were to put in 113, it would equal 720. Okay. But I was having to solve for X. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay. Let's look at example two, finding the number of sides of a polygon. Now notice we're using the corollary here. So they're using one over N times N minus two times 180 equals 140. So I'm gonna come over here and we'll plug that in. And the regular polygons So what does it mean when it says a regular polygon? When it says something is regular, what does that mean? Normal. When associated with a polygon, what does that mean? A regular polygon. I know that all sides are congruent. All angles are congruent. So with a regular polygon, that means every side measure is going to be the same. Every interior angle measure will be the same. So that's what it means when I talk about a regular polygon. So in this one, they've done one divided by N times N minus two times 180, okay? And they said that it was equal to 140 um, degrees. Now, remember, I told you that the other way to look at this would be N minus two times 180 over N, okay? So if I wanted to do it this way, I could either way. Um, now, either way, what am I gonna have to get rid of first to be able to solve? Multiply everything by eight. Why? Because multiplication it undoes uh, It undoes it? Yeah, it uh, <laughs> why? Uh, why they call it? <laughs> um, so when I, I have to get rid of that denominator and um, <laughs> and a fraction is division. To undo division, I use multiplication. So if n is in my denominator, then I have to multiply by n, multiply by n. So these two n's cancel, and I have n minus 2 times 180 is equal to 140 n. What am I going to have to do over here? If I have two terms in parentheses times something, I've got to distribute, okay? That means I've got to do 180 times N is 180 N minus two times 180 is 360 is equal to 140 N. I'm gonna take 140 away, 140 N, and 180 N minus 140 N will be 40 N minus 360 is equal to zero. If I take the same thing away, I've got a zero over there. Add 360, add 360, 40N is equal to 360. So what is N equal to? Uh, nine. It is a regular nine. Nine? Nine. nine. Okay. So when I look at that, remember in this situation, I'm trying to find the number of sides, all right? In the previous situation, we were trying to find the missing angle. So you've got to look and see what am I trying to find? Yes. Does N represent the number of sides? 
n represents the number of sides. So my direction said, how many sides does a polygon have? And so we just found it has nine sides. Look over on page 663, it says the diagrams below show that the sum of the measures of the exterior angles of any convex polygon is 360 degrees. You can find the measure of each exterior angle of a regular polygon. Exercises 45 and 46 ask for proofs of these results. That will not be part of your homework. So notice we take figure one and step one, we can see where they have identified the exterior um, angle measurements. So we can see where um, we have one, two, three, four, five. What do you notice about the number of exterior angles as compared to the interior angles? Mm. What do you notice about the number of exterior angles as compared to the number of interior angles? Look at, look at example, look at number one. How many exterior angles do I have identified? Oh, I'm looking on 0.1.2, 11.2. Look above that. How many exterior angles do I have identified at the top of page 663? I have five exterior angles. How many interior angles are there? Five. Five. So my number of exterior angles is the same as the number of interior angles. Okay. And so notice it says, um, if you were to take all of the exterior angles out, arrange them to form to make 360. So notice theorem 11.2 says polygon exterior angles theorem, the sum of the measures of the exterior angles of a convex polygon, one angle at each vertex is 360. So the exterior angles of a polygon are going to equal 360. The interior is going to be based on the number of sides. Okay, so my interior angles will be determined by the number by the number of sides that I've got. But exterior is going to be 360. So the corollary to 11.2 says the measure of each exterior angle of a regular n gon is one divided by n times 360 or 360 divided by n. Okay, so let's look at example three. Find the value of X in each, di each diagram. So look at letter A. What did we just say that the exterior angles are going to add together to equal? 360. 360, good. So what am I going to do with all of those to be able to solve this problem? Add all of them. Add all of them. So I have 2X plus 2X is? 3X. 2X plus 2X. Uh-oh, yeah. Uh, 4X. 4x plus x. 5x. 5x plus 3x. 8x. 8x plus 4x. 12x. So we have 12x is equal to 360. So I divide by 12, divide by 12, and x is equal to 30. 30. So what do I know? What is 30 telling me? Uh, um, x. Oh. So if I know that each one is, is gonna be 30 degrees, then I can look and say, hey, the one that is X degrees would be 30 degrees. 2X is gonna be 60 degrees. 3X is gonna be 90 degrees and 4X will be 120 degrees. So I can plug in 12, I, mean, I can plug in 30 if I need to. Look at letter B. B says I'm using the corollary to theorem 11.2. So notice X degrees is equal to one divided by seven times 360. So I'm gonna have 360 divided by seven. And 360 divided by seven does not divide evenly and it's approximately 51.4, okay? So I'm gonna set it up to where I have my total 360 divided by seven exterior angles Questions? Go ahead and turn over to 664. Using angle measures in real life. You can use theorems 11.1 and 11.2 and their corollaries to find angle measures. So it says finding angle measures of a polygon. In softball, a home plate marker for a softball field is a pentagon. Three of the interior angles of the pentagon are right angles. The remaining two interior angles are congruent. So what? is the measure of each angle. So how many interior angles do I have? Five. 
I've got five interior angles, right? And so how can I find out um, what my total interior angle measure is? What am I gonna do with that five? How do I find, huh? I need to subtract two. So five minus two is three times 180. So what does my total interior angles equal? 540 degrees, okay? So if I know that there are 540 degrees, how many did they say are right angles? Three. Three of them are right angles. So what's three times 90? 270. 270. So I know that if I have a total of 540, I can subtract 270 because they're right angles. What do I have left? 270. And that 270 is going to be divided amongst the two that are congruent. So 270 divided by two is going to be 135. Can I use the restroom? Is everybody good with how we did that? We said it's a five-sided figure. So I use my theorem to find the measure of the interior angles. Five minus two is three times 180. So we know 540 is the total interior angle measure. They told us that three of the angles were 90 degrees. So the three at 90 degrees is total of 270. So we had to subtract our 90 degree angles. That left us with 270 left over. They told us that the remaining two were congruent. So we divided by two and we found that each of the angles are 135 degrees. So when I have my pentagon, I know I've got a right angle, a right angle, a right angle. I know this one is 135 degrees and this one is 135 degrees, okay? Example five says using angle measures of a regular polygon. Again, what does regular mean? All sides are congruent, all angles are congruent. Is this a regular polygon? Is this picture up here a regular polygon? Nope, because I've got 90 degrees and 135. So I know that my angles are not the same. Okay, so it says, if you were designing the home plate marker for some new type of ball game, would it be possible to make a home plate marker that is a regular polygon with each interior angle having a measure of 135 degrees or 145 degrees? So let's look at the solution. Letter A says, you're gonna start with one divided by N times N minus two times 180 equals 35. And you can find that you have eight sides. An eight-sided figure is called an octagon. octagon. So you could have a home plate that was an octagon. They would all have 135 degree angles. But 145 degrees, I would end up with 10.3 and I can't have 10.3 sides. Okay, <laughs> bless you. So I've got to have a whole number when I talk about the number of sides of something. So I could not have one that would um, be 145 degrees each. All right, let's look at 665, guided practice. <clears throat> Number one says, name an interior angle and an exterior angle of the polygon shown at the right. So what are my interior angles going to be? How many am I gonna have? Five interior angles, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, how many exterior angles do they have marked on here? Wait, sorry. Zombies are gonna come walking in. <laughs> um, how many exterior angles are labeled? Three, Three. I've got AEF, I've got BCG and GCH, but I also have HCD. Okay, so I've got one, two, three, all right, look at number two. How many exterior angles are there in an N-gon? How many exterior angles do I have in an N-gon? All of them. How would I figure out? N minus 
two. Okay. So basically, when I've got exterior angles, um, I'm going to be using. So think about this for a minute. So notice I've got an exterior angle here. How many exterior angles do I have on a triangle? Six. Six. How many exterior angles would I have on a, a pentagon? Ten. Ten. So two times the number of interior angles will be the number of exterior angles. And what do I know that they all add together to equal? 360, okay. So I know that I'm gonna have two exterior angles at each vertex, okay? Let's look at number three, find the value of X. How am I going to find the value of X in number three? How many sides do I have in my figure? Five, Five sides, so what is my total interior angle measurement? We said it has five sides. Five minus two is three. Three times 180 is 540. So it was already up here. Oh, I know why he was calling me. He was asking what time he needs to get here. Can I tell him that real quick? Huh? He has to come to school today because my biology teacher wanted him to come. Okay, what? just text him. Okay. All right. Um, so I know I have five sides. I know my total. It's 540 degrees. How am I going to solve for X? 115 plus 120 plus 105 plus 105 plus X. So we know we're going to have a plus X. 115 plus 120 plus 105 plus 105 is going to be. 5, 10, 15, 3 by 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 445 plus X equals 540, subtract 445, subtract 445, X is equal to 95. Okay, so that's number three. First, I had to find what is my total number of interior angle measures. Then I had to add together the given ones, use X, that represents my unknown, solve for X. Look at number four, what kind of figure do they tell me this is? An octagon. How many right. sides does it have? Uh, eight. Look at it, how Seven. many sides does number four have? Seven. Seven. I was six, I'm wild. Six. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was an octagon. <laughs> It is a number four. Is everybody on number four? That's number five, honey. Yes, we're on number four. So number four, what is this called? It's a hexagon and it's a regular hexagon. Why? Sides and angles are equal to each other. Octagon is eight sides. That's number five. We are on number four. <laughs> this has been a weird day. All right, number four, hexagon, six sides. What? And it's a regular hexagon because what have they taken time to tell me? All sides are congruent. all sides are congruent. What else is congruent? All angles are congruent. All angles are congruent. So what am I going to do with my total angle? How am I going to find my total angle interior sum? How many sides do I have? Six. six. Six minus two times 180. What is six minus two? Four. What is four times 180? 720. We know the total is 720 degrees. How many total sides do I have? Six. So 720 divided by six is equal to? Ooh, Three. No, <laughs> not 90. <laughs> 120 degrees? Yes. Wow, that makes sense. Okay, so I took my number of sides minus two times 180 gave me my total interior measures. 
Then I took that total divided by my number of sides. So each angle is 120 degrees. Look at number five. What do I know that my exterior angles add up to be? 360. So I know my total is 360. How many sides do I have? Eight. 360 divided by eight is going to be? 45. Okay. 24. Huh? Interior angles, number of sides minus two times 180 gives me my total interior. All polygons have an exterior of 360, all regular polygons. Okay, so 360 minus the number, I divided by the number of sides. The homework in this section will be pages 665 to 666, number seven through 25 odds. So let's look, that's on page 665. Then turn over to 666. We have numbers 29 through 37 odds. So 29 through 32, you're given the number of sides of a regular polygon. What does regular mean? All sides are congruent. All sides are congruent. So what am I gonna, what do I know they equal? The exterior is equal to 360. 360. So all I'm gonna do is take 360 and divide by the number they've given me. Numbers 33 through 37. In exercises 33 through 36, you're given the uh, measure of each exterior angle of an n gone, and you need to find the value of n. Okay. So what am I going? So like in number 34. What am I dividing 20 into to find my number of sides? 360. What? 360, good. Exterior is 360. And then number 37, a convex hexagon has exterior angles that measure 48, 52, 55, 62, and 68. What is the measure of the exterior angle of the sixth vertex? So solve for that. All right, 11-2, page 669. Finding the area of an equilateral triangle. What is an equilateral triangle? All sides are the same. Hmm? Oh, all sides are the same. All sides are the same. Remember lateral, we talked about meaning sides. Equiangular is equal angles. Equilateral is equal sides. So it says the area of an equilateral triangle. The area of an equilateral triangle, um, it says the area of any triangle with, ba with base length B and height H is given by area equals one half base times height. That's what we've been used to using. The following formula for equilateral triangles, however, uses only the side length. So in this one, I don't know my height. I only know my side lengths. And so I have the area of an equilateral triangle is one fourth the square of the lengths of the sides times the square root of three. Are you gonna to need to look back to this formula to be able to write these, to work these problems? Very probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got it in your notes also. So you can see 11 two, it's right here in your notes as well. So A equals one fourth times the square root of three times S squared. What does S represent? Sides. The side length, good. So whatever my side length is. Okay, let's look at example one. Example one, they're, say, they're saying we're gonna prove theorem 11.3. Look at the picture that we have. Notice in 11.3, do I know my side lengths? No. Mm -mm. They haven't told us, what is the only measurement that I know? Your 60. I know A. 60 degree angles. A. What do I know my height is? 30. The square root of three divided by two times S is the height, okay? That's 30 degrees, that's my upper angle, okay? And so it says, I know that the area, I can use my formula A equals one fourth times the square root of three times S squared, okay? And so I'm having to use that. What do I know about what kind of, what, when this is broken into two, when I have an altitude drawn, what kind of triangles do I end up having? An equilateral triangle can be turned into what? Two types of what? If this is 60, this is 60, this is 60, and I draw an altitude through here, 
each of these become 30 and 30, right? And what is this? 90 and 90. So I've got 30, 60, 90 triangles. You remember when we had 30, 60, 90? Mm -hmm. What did I know about my sides? What was the short side? What was the long side? What was the hypotenuse? Y'all remember that? Yes. I told y'all you had to remember it. Um, what are the measures? Okay, so my short side is going to be X. What is my hypotenuse? 2X. Yes. And what is my square root. height? The square root of 3 times X. Remember that? Okay. So if we look at example two, finding the area. So first of all, they were just saying that we are proving that this is an, this is an equilateral triangle using that. We have two 30, 60, 90 triangles. We can show that um, each side, we can see that we've got um, our long side, our hypotenuse and our height. And so it tells me that the area is equal to one half base times height. But if I look at that, one half base times height is also equal to one fourth times the square root of three times S squared. That is telling why is because when I look at each of these measurements, I can put that into that formula. So example two says, find the area of an equilateral triangle with eight inch sides. Okay, so we've just said, what is our formula we're using? Area is equal to one half base times height. Equilateral triangle. Area is equal to one fourth oh. times the square root of three times S squared. What did it tell me my side measures are? What is S equal? Example two, page 669. What did the directions tell me? Equals eight. Equals eight. So area is equal to one fourth times the square root of three times eight squared. Order of operations tells me I'm gonna do what? Order of operations. What is order of operations? And this. According to this order of operations, what am I gonna solve first in this problem? Multiplication. What does E stand for? Exponent. Exponents. Do I have an exponent? Yes. Mm -hmm. So A is equal to 1 fourth times the square root of 3 times 64. Now, what am I going to do? All of this is multiplication, right? So does it matter what order I'm multiplying? No. no. So I'm going to go the easy way. What is going to be the easiest thing to deal with? One fourth, the square root of three, 64. What two can I multiply together first to make it easy? Uh, hmm? square root three three times That's the square root of three. Do I know what it is? No. Do I know what a fourth is? Yes. How would I multiply one fourth by 64? Multiply everything by four. You mm, take the dominant. The four to the other side. Four no, that's not right. How would I multiply one fourth oh, times 64? Yeah. All I'm doing is dividing 64 by four. When I multiply a number by a fraction, as long as my numerator is one, I'm dividing by whatever that number is in the de denominator. So what is 64 divided by four? 16. 16, so A is equal to 16 times the square root of three. So I could leave it like that, or what is 16 times the square root of three as a decimal? 27.7. Oh. Oh, all the, all the, like, did you? Big brain. <laughs> so yeah, so all you have to do is in your calculator, do the square root of three, whatever that answer is, times 16. I just did 16 square root of three. There you go. Okay. So in this problem, we substituted 
our value of s. Then, so I had to square it first. We said that was eight, eight squared is 64. You could do one divided by four and get 0.25, multiply 0.25 times the square root of three and then multiply that by 64, you're gonna get the same answer either way. But to me, it's easier to say, hey, 64 divided by four is 16, so then I just multiply that by the square root of three, okay? Okay, so we've just gotten through 11.3 theorem, okay? So we haven't gotten to that first oh. bubble yet. So let's go ahead and turn the page to 670. And it says you can use equilateral triangles to find the area of a regular hexagon. Why? How can I use equilateral triangles to find the area of a regular hexagon? It's kind of like a pie piece of all the okay, because a regular hexagon, what do I know about my angle measures? They're all congruent. They're all congruent. What do I know about my side measures? They're all, They're all congruent. So an equilateral triangle has all congruent sides. So, I, so I've got my triangles inside, but how many, if it's a six-sided figure, how many triangles am I going to have? Six. Six triangles. Mm -mm. If I have um, six, remember if it's six sides, I'm going to have four triangles because remember we did number of sides minus two in our last section, the number of sides minus two. I feel like you could get six and then two. That's from the center. From the center, yeah. Oh, okay. yes. Like, like if it yes. Like high. Yes. So I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking along the same thing you were thinking. Oh, yes. Okay. If we look at the center. So let's go ahead and move down. It says, I, didn't understand. I was just talking about the number of sides and interior angles and being able to figure out the measure of each interior angle. Okay. All right, so it says investigating the area of a regular hexagon. So it says to use a protractor and a ruler to draw and we're not gonna do that just yet, but it says um, fold and draw three lines through opposite vertices and the point where these lines intersect is the center of the hexagon. So we can see in the picture below it, where we would have that center of a hexagon. If I were to fold it along the vertices, I would have that center. And so it says, think of a hexagon in the activity above or another regular polygon as an inscribed in a circle. What does that mean, inscribed in a circle? Inscribed. What does in mean? Inside. What does the word scribed mean? What was a scribe? written inside. Okay, so an inscribed polygon, we said we're going to think about it. So previously in another chapter, we learned about inscribed polygons. So an inscribed polygon is a polygon that is drawn inside of a circle and each of the vertices are on the circle. So look at our first bullet point. We previously learned that a polygon that has all of its vertices on a circle um, should be is an, not it is an, should be just is an inscribed polygon. A polygon that has all of its vertices on the circle is an inscribed polygon. So it says the center of the polygon and radius of the polygon are the center and radius of its circumscribed, what? So if my polygon is inscribed, what is on the outside? It's the circle. circle, yeah. Okay, so bullet point number three, the center of the polygon and radius of the polygon are the center and radius of its circumscribed circle. I, I didn't catch what number one was supposed to be. Inscribed. Bullet point number two was inscribed polygon. And so if the polygon is on the inside, then the circle is on the outside. Circumscribed means outside. It's drawn around it, okay? So our polygon is inscribed. The circle is circumscribed. So I can use the center of my polygon and my center of my polygon is going to be the same as the center of that circle. Therefore, I know when I'm dealing with circles, I have radius and diameter. It's gonna be the same thing for this polygon. I now have a center and I have a radius of my polygon. And so it says the distance from the center to any side of the polygon is called the, oh, 
a possum of the polygon. Okay, so bullet point number one, two, three, four, a possum. Bullet point four is a possum, and it says the possum is the height of a triangle between the center and two consecutive vertices of the polygon. So if we look at our figure on page 670, notice my red line that goes from point G to point H, which is between A and B. That is my apothem. So the apothem is equal to, what do we call that in a circle? This is the height. Well, it's the height of the triangle, but what is it in, in my circle? What is that same measurement? The distance of the, what is the segment that goes from the center to the circle? Radius. The radius, good. So my apothem and my radius are gonna have the same measurements. Right, it's not quite this, but it's gonna, yeah, you're right. Okay, so it says we've got the center of the polygon and the radius of the polygon are the center and radius of the circumscribed circle, respectively. The distance from the center to any side of the polygon is called the apothem of the polygon. The apothem is the height of the triangle between the center and two consecutive vertices of the polygon. As in the activity, you can find the area of any regular n-gon by dividing the polygon into congruent triangles. So again, where we have area is equal to the area of one triangle times the number of triangles. So in this situation, we have one half times the apothem times one side length times the number of sides. So depending on the number of sides, they're just using the side length S here. So we have one half times the apothem times the perimeter of the polygon. Why are they using perimeter here? Where did they get perimeter from? Hmm? What is perimeter? The sum of the sides. So why are they using perimeter here? Okay. Right here, we started out with one half times the apothem times side length this times the number of sides. So I'm multiplying my number of sides times the side length. That is my perimeter. So I've got one half of the apothem times the perimeter of the polygon because I multiplied my side length times the number of sides. This is shown in theorem 11.4. This is the area of a regular polygon. The area of a regular n-gon with side length s is half the product of the apothem and the perimeter. Okay, so we're gonna have a is equal to, now notice it's capital A because we're talking about what? What does capital A yeah, tell me? Yeah. Area, what is lowercase a in this apothem. apothem? Good. So capital A area is equal to one half lowercase a apothem times capital P, which is our perimeter or I can look at it as one half of the apothem times the number of sides, or the, the number of sides times the side length, okay? So that's what N times S is. That's the same as perimeter, the number of sides times the side length, okay? So I can plug in. If I know my apothem, I can plug it in. If I know my number of sides, I can plug it in. If I know my side length, I plug it in. If I know the perimeter, then I plug it in. So over on 671, a central angle of a regular polygon is an angle whose vertex is the center and whose sides contain two consecutive vertices on the polygon. You can divide 360 degrees by the number of sides to find the measure of each central angle of the polygon. Okay, so let's look at example three, finding the area of a regular polygon. A regular pentagon is inscribed in a circle with a radius of one unit. Find the area of the pentagon. So it says to apply the formula for the area of the regular pentagon, you must first, you must find its apothem and its perimeter, okay? So it says the measure of central angle ABC is one fifth of 360, why? Okay, my total circle 360, I know it's a five-sided figure, so I know that each angle is 72 degrees. 
and an in an isosceles triangle ABC, the altitude to base AC also bisects angle ABC and side AC. The measure of angle DBC then is 36 degrees. So look at DBC. I know that that is 36 degrees. In a right triangle, triangle AB and B, triangle BDC, you can use trigonometric ratios to find the length of the legs. Okay, so now we're bringing in sine, cosine, and tangent because now I need to find the lengths of those legs. Remember, I told you a lot of what we're learning is not in isolation. We have to remember it. It carries on to the next thing. The reason we had to learn how to find lengths of legs using sine, cosine, and tangent is because now we're applying it to finding the area of a polygon. So if I know, remember my main thing when I use Sakatoa. I look to see what two things do I have already to use? Or what do I have and what am I trying to solve for? So I look and see, do I have the adjacent? Do I have the hypotenuse? Do I have the opposite? I look to see what I'm solving for, what I have, what do I need, okay? So we can see that if we're trying to find the cosine of 36 degrees, that means we've got side BD over BC. BD over one is equal to BD. Sine of 36 degrees is equal to DC over BC. So DC over one is equal to DC. So the Pentagon has an apothem of A, my apothem is equal to B times D, which is equal to the cosine of 36 degrees. And it has a perimeter of P, which is five times AC, which is five times two times DC. So we have 10 times the sine of 36 degrees, okay? So when I use my formula, I plug all this in. Area equals one half of the apothem times the perimeter. So my apothem is now actually the cosine of 36. My perimeter is 10 times the sine of 36. So when I multiply all that together and divide by two, I end up with 2.38 square units. So now I know my side lengths, okay? You're gonna to need to look back at these examples. Take step by step through the examples, okay? Good, yes. Example four is where we will pick up tomorrow, okay? So your only homework for right now is 11-1. It's gonna be to your benefit to go ahead and get started on it. So you can kind of have an idea, first of all, it shouldn't be too difficult. That's the easiest part of the section. We're just looking at our number of sides, interior angles, exterior angles, all that good stuff. So we will not check 11-1 until next week. Next Wednesday is when we'll check the homework for it, okay? But like I said, it's to your benefit to have it done for class tomorrow. But if you've got other stuff you're catching up on, it may not work that way. All right, if you need to stay late and work with me, y'all know y'all are always welcome to stay after class. Um, so anyway, I hope everybody has a great afternoon and I will see y'all tomorrow. Well, tell her I said hello.